as Pastor Pavel already mentioned, God has been speaking to us the last two weeks about being anointed to wait tables and being anointed to reach the one. And the book of Acts is becoming alive to us as God is reminding us of the need that we have for the power of his spirit to walk and to do that which he's called us to do. And I believe that God is wanting to dive deeper this morning into the life of Stephen and how I believe it supernaturally connects with the life of Saul, or should I say Paul. But I want you to turn to please Acts chapter six, verse eight. Acts chapter six, verse eight. And it says, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the providence of Caesarea and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, the follower never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw his face and it was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? And in chapter seven, it goes on as Stephen answers and he stands before the Sanhedrin and he begins to tell them of their glorious history and their faith. He speaks about Abraham and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and he tells them the story of their history, the story of these men that were sent to Israel to deliver them, to lead them, to guide them. But he spoke to the Sanhedrin and he reminded them, but the Israelites kept going back to their old ways of thinking and their old ways of doing. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, so Acts chapter seven, verse 51, this is the crux of what Stephen, after he gives them this beautiful picture of the faithfulness and the provision of God, this, these few verses in verse 51 through 53, Stephen lays it at him. And I believe it's because Stephen in that moment knew he had nothing to lose, but to be as brutally honest as he possibly could. And in verse 51, it says, you stiff neck people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet you ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. That's quite an ending to quite a speech. He lets them have it. He knows he has nothing to lose. And he says to them, why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? Can't you see from the beginning of time, I have tried to commune with you. All I have longed for was fellowship with you. All I have given is provision and mercy and grace and faithfulness and goodness. Why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? And in that moment, it says this, this group of Christian religious leaders, these self-righteous leaders are furious. They get so angry that the Bible says they begin to gnash their teeth at Stephen. That is anger on a whole nother level. It's one thing to be mad, it's another thing to be frustrated, but when you're so furious that your body is clenching in anger, and it says, that Stephen 
in this moment full of the Holy Spirit looks up and sees the glory of God and Jesus sitting at his right hand in the midst of all of these men so angry and so furious, Stephen's response is to look up and to see the glory of God. To see Jesus sitting at the right hand, that was his response. And I believe that that even infuriated the Sanhedrin even more because in the Bible it says they began to put their hands over their ears and yell to the top of their lungs. They look like three-year-olds throwing a fit. Mine do that anyways. They do that constantly. But I cannot imagine a group of, of men so dignified, so distinguished, has a waiter of tables standing in front of them, and it angers them so much. The truth angers them so much that they put their hands over their ears and they just begin to yell and shout. And what does Stephen do? What is this waiter of tables as we heard, this anointed man of God, all his position is to wait on tables. That's all he is, he's a waiter standing before the Sanhedrin. He is anointed to wait tables, but he stands before them and in their fury, in their anger, he doesn't say, wait, 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 guys, I'm just a waiter, you got the wrong guy. He doesn't say, I'm not significant, I'm not really a threat, what's the big deal, people? Please don't kill me. He doesn't say any of that. In fact, he doesn't actually say much at all. Maybe because in that moment, he's beholding the glory of God and he understands that I'm anointed for a purpose and God has a plan for my life. I can wait tables and then I can stand in front of the enemy itself and behold the glory of God. He doesn't even say much. If it was in that moment and there were grown men gnashing their teeth at me, yelling at me, I would be pleading for my life. I would be begging to be rescued. I would be calling on the mercy of God. But yet Stephen just stood in their midst and behold his glory. That is an incredible moment of a man of a woman who understands that I am nothing and he is everything. I can't, but he can. I'm anointed because he has anointed me. It's not because I'm so eloquent of a speaker. It's not because I have it all together, but it's because I understand that I belong to him, that I can stand in the face of my enemy and behold his glory and not even have to defend myself. And the Bible goes on to talk about what Stephen actually said. And his words were few. And in Acts chapter seven, verses 59, as they had drug him out of the city gates and as they began stoning him. Can you imagine this moment? This is not schoolyard stones that were thrown at him. These were stones thrown with the intent to kill. These were stones thrown with the intent to take his life. And he's drug out of the city gates and one stone upon another stone upon another stone are hitting him to the left and to the right over and over and over again. And it says in the scriptures, he falls to his knees and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit And he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Of all the things to say, of all the things to say, as you're being pelted by stones and you're gasping for breath at this time, the last thing that you and I would probably ever say is, Lord, don't hold their sin against them. What a moment, what a moment, what a mercy moment that these people, full of their anger, full of their own self-righteousness, full of what they think might be right, 
They don't even know that they're in need of mercy. Stephen is the only one in that moment that understands that my enemy and those that are coming against me, those that are so depraved in their thinking, they're the ones in need of mercy, not me. That's what Stephen's saying. Stephen understands because he's so full of glory and the grace of God. He's not asking for mercy for himself. He's asking for mercy for his enemy. Don't hold it against them, God. And then it says he fell asleep. That was it. Those are the last words that Stephen spoke. His Lord, do not hold it against them. I want to be at a place in my life when my enemies come against me, when hard times push against me, because they will for both you and I. Can I not have a cry of mercy inside of me? I pray mercy over my enemies. I pray for mercy for those who don't even know that they need it. That's the beauty of that moment. They didn't even know they needed it. But Stephen did, and Stephen had a love that transcended his moment of death because he had walked with God and beheld his glory, and he knew that something was more than just this temporary life. And I love that a man anointed to wait tables knew the most profound truth of the glory and the mercy of God. If you can turn with me to Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 19. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. This is where I believe, in my own personal opinion, that the story of Stephen and the story of Saul are somewhat interlaced together. Because in Acts chapter seven, it talks about how Saul witnessed Stephen's stoning. It even says that maybe those who went out to throw the stones, it says that they cast their cloaks at Saul's feet. And I was reading a commentary and they said, sometimes it's like, you know, when you go out and your kids are playing soccer and they dump all their stuff on you and ask you to hold everything. Can you take the water bottle and the jacket and then this and the that? Because they need to go out and do stuff. It gives that same impression that Saul was there somewhere in the vicinity of Stephen's stoning and it says the people just laid their cloaks at his feet. He was the guy watching the stuff, basically. And as much as he was watching the stuff, he was watching the stoning of Stephen take place. And it says that Stephen even approved, um, Saul even approved of the stoning of Stephen. And now we pick up in chapter nine, verse one. And meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will, behold, you will be told what to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for the man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he, in verse 14, and he came here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And then lastly in verse 
16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. When I was reading and I was praying and you're, you're considering the mercy of, and the prayer and the heart of Stephen, I began to think about Saul that day and how Saul, though holding down the stuff, maybe watching from a distance, he witnessed Stephen's murder, but he also might've heard Stephen's prayer and cry for mercy. That the act of the stoning of Stephen be not held against those who were stoning, who were witnessing, who were approving, who were allowing. You see, Saul was on a mission. Saul had a mission, maybe a self-appointed mission, an ambitious mission, maybe not something obviously we would agree with, but he was a man full of purpose with the authority of man in his hand to go into Damascus and take any of those man or woman and bring them to prison in Jerusalem. And this man on a mission is headed down on the road to Damascus and it says he's, he's almost where he's wanting to go. He's just shy of his, desti his destiny and his destination, just about to be where he intended to go. And it said that light flashed and the glory of God came and met him and he fell to his knees. He was blinded. He then later was transformed and healed and we know the miraculous story of Paul. But is it possible that Saul, that man full of purpose, he wasn't actually looking for mercy. Do you realize that? He was on his journey doing what he felt was right and the mercy of God encounters him in a supernatural way. He wasn't a seeker of mercy. He wasn't looking for the right thing to do. He wasn't in no way repentive, wanting to know, is the, if, am I missing something in, in my life? He actually had so much purpose and personal conviction and authority in his hands, thinking he was doing the right thing. But in a moment, the mercy of God encounters him when he doesn't even expect it. He's not expecting the mercy of God, but is it possible that the unexpected prayer of mercy from Stephen was heard by a miraculous and all powerful God and on that road to Damascus, the mercy of God met Saul in an unexpected way. Is it possible? Is it possible that the anointed waiter of tables prayer to prayer in the last moments of his life and said, God, don't hold it against him. Is it possible that on that road to Damascus that then the unexpected of mercy comes to Saul and by the grace and mercy of God, he's transformed into Paul. Is it possible? Is it possible that God heard the prayer of Stephen? And is it possible that one answer to that prayer was the conversion of Saul into Paul? Is it possible? I want to share with you my heart that I believe each one of us in this room, this group of people anointed to wait tables in our everyday lives, being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is our right, our privilege, and our obligation to begin to pray prayers of mercy on behalf of those who don't expect it, don't even think they need it, and by all accounts, don't even deserve it. But it is our right and our privilege and our obligation to begin to pray for the mercy of God not solely for ourselves, but for the benefit of another. You know, the more that I'm around hurting people, the more I realize they get used to their brokenness and they don't even know that they need to change. It just becomes a way of living. The cycle of addiction, of abuse, of depression, of wayward thinking, of 
pornography, whatever, it becomes normal. You and I might ask ourselves because we have the Holy Spirit that we struggle against these things and we walk in the mercy of grace of God. But for so many people, their brokenness becomes their norm. And they need us who are filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ to begin to cry out for mercy on their behalf because they don't even know that they need it. Can we be a people who cry out for mercy on behalf of another? Because we understand something, because we've been given the most beautiful gift of salvation. You know, it reminds me of the prayer of our Savior who hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sounds an awful like a lot like Stephen's prayer to me. And I believe that God prayed that even on our behalf. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And God is trying, I believe, to reach us and call us in our ordinary lives to live supernaturally believing in him. Because his love is incredible. But to me, his mercy is astounding. We don't deserve it. Those men stoning Stephen didn't deserve mercy. They deserved to be punished themselves. They deserved the stones to be thrown right back in their face. But God showed his mercy to them. When Jesus hung upon the cross and said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He was saying that, I believe, to us. Can you remember the moment that God's mercy came into your life when you understood that his love is so full and his mercy is so deep? And are we not grateful for that this morning, amen? We are grateful for that. And now my challenge to you and I is to be people who pray for mercy for those who don't deserve it, those who maybe even cause us pain, the enemies that, that rage at us in fury and anger, for those living in depravity and darkness where it just has become their norm, can we not pray for mercy? Can we not even come out this Wednesday night as we've been called to pray for the nation? Can we ask for mercy for those who are not even looking for mercy because we know that they have need of it? God is incredible. His love is unmeasured and his mercy is truly astounding. And as we live in that mercy, full of the Holy Spirit, watch what God will do. Watch what he will do. He will encounter people on their own personal roads to Damascus and meet them in their places of need that they don't even know they have need of. Saul, the worst of the worst, was met in an unexpected mercy moment and it changed all of history and all of time. You don't know in your everyday walk and the people that you encounter if they but had a mercy moment. There's people in my life and in my family, I pray to God above that they experience his mercy and his grace and his love because I know when they do, there'll be no denying his power, no denying the depth of the love that he has for them. His mercy is new every single morning. You know, it's funny. He doesn't say his love is new every morning. He says his mercy is new every morning. And I believe that love is constant, that love is given, and that love is for all. But that mercy is needful every day because God knows the day that each one of us have. He knows the things that we're going to face and he's gonna give us just enough mercy for today so that we stay dependent upon him for tomorrow. Let us walk in the mercy of God and let us pray prayers of mercy for others who don't even know they need it. I'm gonna invite the worship team back. 
at this time, and I'm going to turn the service back over to Pastor Pavel. Thank you for hearing my heart today. And if you heard nothing else, hear this. The mercy of God is your portion, and it's our privilege as believers to pray prayers of mercy for other people. It's unbelievable. And I pray that my words were not my words, but that you heard something from the heart of God, even if it be just one thing. I'd like to ask you to all stand. God, we come before you. God, we come before you in this moment of understanding your mercy. God, I thank you for the mercy that you've poured out upon each one of our lives. And God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would show us what your mercy really means. God, I pray, Lord, that you begin to anoint us to pray prayers of mercy for other people. God, I pray, Lord, those that are not expecting, those are not even desiring, those do not even want to change. Would you anoint us to stand in the gap on their behalf and cry out mercy, mercy, oh God, mercy. God, would you meet them in their depravity? Would you meet them in their darkness? Would you meet them in their brokenness? Would you meet them in their complacency? God of all mercy and love and grace, would you come upon their lives and would you speak truth? Would you reveal yourself to them? God, they may be on a mission, they may have a path, or God, maybe they're just trotting and trying to get through the day, but God, in your mercy and in your grace, would you come and speak? God, would you reveal yourself, God, like, like you did to Saul? God, would you reveal yourself to this nation, to our family? God, would you would move and do what only you can do? God, we exalt you. Holy Spirit, we admit our need for you. God, we are powerless and weak without you. God, I can only imagine where we would be if it wasn't for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, God. And now I pray that we not be a selfish people who just hold on to mercy for ourselves, but God, we would be an empowered people who believe for mercy for others. God, others who it seems like they don't deserve it, if they haven't done anything to earn it, but God, you in your grace, would you meet them? In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen.